Welcome here to the Gamma Project. My name is Justin McGuire. I'm here with Rian Olafir, all the way well, from South Africa, in my neighborhood now. Um, welcome, Rian. Thank you. Thanks very much. We're leading up to the Christmas break soon. Um, any plans? No, just uh, going to get in some rest as much as I can and then uh, prepare myself mentally for, for next year. Any reading material? that you're going to be engaged in or you're just going to take a nice chill time? Uh, nothing specific, but, but I spend a lot of time on YouTube at the moment and researching some, some, some stuff. Um, not always just about training, but, but also the mentality side of, of things. So yeah. Psychology is very important. Oh, I love, I find it so fascinating. Um, the more I read about it, the more I listen to it, the more, the more fascinating it is. So I try and, and spend more time on the, psychological part of it now as well yeah well i'll definitely send you some stuff on urology i'll send you some video clips from a very good doctor mm. uh, that discusses how the mind works in terms of the, how it responds to an environment and how you can influence your orchestration to your environment to be more calm mm. so the thing is about being calm yeah secret when you're calm you see everything around you and you can respond mm. this way um, which is what we spoke about in our last Zoom session was the right type of exercise, the right type of person at the right time. You know, pre-workout, the pre-workout nation running into the gym, hocked up on stimulants in essence, which is what a pre-workout is, hoping for a good result because you feel high. That's what pre-workouts do, they make you high. But if you can't really contract muscle, if you're so disassociated with your body, because you're high. So, and I'm not saying amino acids don't help. I take amino acids before I train and they enhance contraction to a great degree. But it's a question of being calm to allow muscle to stretch and also to realize where your joints are while you're doing a movement, where your body is. Rather than just load and lifting, straining, lifting load, think about okay, where, if I'm gonna get out of this chair, I can get out like this and have no conscious idea how I'm getting up and use my spine. Whereas if I'm calmer, I say, okay, great. Where are my hips? So they pull back in to themselves, my spine in a nice position. And how am I getting out using the pelvis? So small little things like that have a big impact on what muscle you train. You can move from point A to B, sure. It doesn't mean your muscle is going to contract from point A to B, or at least not the muscle you want to contract. Yeah. So, Rion, uh, we're going to just go into a little bit more detail about what this all means for the viewers out there. So, I'll let you start off by asking your first question. Okay. Um, I want to know how would exercise selection differ when you're in a strength phase versus a hypertrophy phase? Okay. Let's just first distinguish what the difference is between a strength phase and a hypertrophic phase. For those out there that aren't very well versed on the um, terminology in the strength and conditioning world, a strength phase is generally when you lift a load from 85% and above. And generally when you lift a load of 85%, it would equate to a five repetition maximum. Hypertrophy phase is when you lift loads from 80% down to 60%. So 60% to 80% load. You can lift loads up to 85% and still have a functional capacity. But the tension time, anything really below 25 seconds becomes more strength-based. Mm -hmm. So you have 25 to 40 seconds. You have what they call functional hypertrophy which is more engaging, gross, more gross motor units because you have to lift a larger amount of weight. Whereas from 40 to 70 seconds of tension is more standard hypertrophy, just enlarging itself. So the word functional in front of hypertrophy relates to the brain because the brain has to orchestrate a far more dynamic response to allow the body to be stable, enough so to lift a gross amount of weight. So that's the difference between the two. So going back again, now that we understand, ask a question one more time for us, Theria. 
how would exercise selection differ when you're in a strength phase versus a hypertrophy phase? Okay, so if we understand that a strength phase is generally going to recruit more motor units, it's going to incorporate lifting a greater volume of weight, can we safely say that the exercise selection in order to increase the strength threshold of the body itself should be more compounded. Now, if we're going to be lifting, if we're going to try and do strength training, I'm not saying you can't, for a small muscle group like, let's say the biceps, right? doing five reps, five sets of five reps on the bicep. Would you, would you think that that would be beneficial for the growth rate of the bicep? For me, no, I've never, I've tried it and I just don't feel it's effective at all. I've done, I've done four reps, five reps, even, even six reps with, with a slow eccentric. And I have to really slow down the eccentric to about five or six seconds on say a, a dumbbell curl to really feel like I'm getting any sort of benefit. Now think about the bicep. The bicep is actually a postural muscle, but it's a, very small postural muscle in comparison to the pectorals. Now, postural muscles generally engage better with higher volume of training. Mm -hmm. If you're going to train the pectorals, and you can do bench presses or singles, doubles, triples, for sure. And there are a lot of people out there that do them and they get great results. But generally speaking, when you train a muscle towards its intended use within the body, in a more postural nature or more phasic in nature, it's going to grow according to spinal extensors, postural. So when you're doing back extensions, would you want to do five reps on the back extension? No, probably not. 12 to 20 reps on yeah. the back, back extension. Biceps. Do we want to do five reps? Maybe once in a while to engage more neural connection so it can handle greater load, so we tear. But generally speaking, when we try and increase hypertrophy of the bicep, going for low loads is not going to be beneficial. So an exercise or programming for hypertrophy and a difference between hypertrophy and strength, one can easily understand that the more isolated and the more defined the angle of execution will be to a precise muscle, more likely it's going to be toward a hypertrophic plane rather than a strength plane, where the more gross volume of muscle mass incorporated to shift the load would be more conducive for a strength training plan. Now, there are strength training plans out there where you'll do supinated pull-ups for five reps, which is not just the biceps, it's actually incorporating the lats, external rotators, mm -hmm. rhomboids. But are your, what's your objective? Is your objective to get the muscle, i.e. the bicep, bigger? Or is your objective to get the neural patterning stronger? So we, that's when we come down to the difference of exercise selection from a strength protocol to a hypertrophy protocol. Strength protocol's main objective is to increase the strength between the neural patterns of your mind, your central nervous system, to your muscle, which is your part of, part of the peripheral nervous system. And that's the purpose, main purpose of a strength training protocol. A hypertrophy training protocol, yes, sure, you are going to increase that link as well because you are creating synaptic response, but more so to create more of a metabolic effect. So you create more of an acid environment within the tissue, which creates a release of metabolites to initiate a hormonal response, a more gross hormonal response. When we lift heavy, we do activate more satellite cells. Yes. But when we also lift heavy, and we have longer rest period, which is certainly standard in the science of sports and uh, sports conditioning, the greater the load, the longer the recovery, not necessarily for the body, but more for the nervous system. So, taking that all into account, Exercise selection. Compound lifts work better for strength training. Your squats, your deadlifts, your pull-ups, your presses. Coming to presses though, 
would you agree that a military press, standard military press, not a seated military press, a standard conventional military press, is far more compounded in nature than a bench press? Yes. So when someone says to me, but you say presses are compounded, what about bench press? Yeah, bench press is also compounded, sure. But a bench press is far more isolatory to what the muscle mass is intended to grow than a military press. Okay, military press works everything right down to your toes. Right? You gotta have the, the glute knee uh, switched on stable enough so that the force can be driven through the pelvis into the femur, down to the knees and into the ankles. Otherwise, when you press that bar above your head, what's gonna happen? The spine is not to support itself effectively. And we go into a kyphotic curve, and overuse the trapezius, overuse the anterior deltoid, not the incorporation of the medial deltoid, nor the depressors of the scapula, i.e. the lower trapezius and part of the rhomboids. So what's gonna happen? You're gonna cause overactivity subscapularis, serratus anterior, shorten the angle between the bicep and the pectoral, will strain, so on and so forth. So it's far more compounded and a lot more difficult to do a military press because it incorporates so much more to stabilize, just to allow for the movement to occur in the first place than a bench press. All right? Any time, sorry, any situation in which you have a supporting structure that enables stability, or that movement to be performed. Hack squat machine, as opposed to a barbell hack squat. A leg press, as opposed to a squat, which is not completely different, you completely can't compare the two in my opinion. A lot of people try to compare the two, but they um, you have no incorporation of the full chain when you're doing a leg press. Your, back, your spine is supported, and one of the biggest benefits from doing uh, squats is the incorporation of the spinal extensors with the gluteals during the extension of uh, so the eccentric phase of movement where the spinal extensors become more shortened oh. and under strain, particularly the thoracic component of the spinal extensors and the glutes become more lengthened, the glute max and uh, some of the gluteal fibers should become shortened in certain phases of the squat in the eccentric phase. So, what is it that we're going to do? So we've got leg extensions, you've got that sort of hack squats, more supported on a, on a peripheral basis because you have a structure helping with stabilizers or a barbell hack squat, which is more compounded. They both seemingly are the same movement, but what are you going to do for hypertrophy? For the purpose of bodybuilding, what's the main purpose? To enlarge the muscle fiber in question. How do we create more growth to a particular fiber this is we isolate that muscle. Correct. How do we take out synergistic dominance, which is dominance of other fibers that aid the movement? Because let's remember, the body doesn't act in isolation. Although I, I, when we say isolation, muscle never really operates in isolation. Right. There are dynamic factors involved where you'll have synergists, antagonists working in concert to allow the movement to occur in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, but um, when, we, when we talk about isolation also, I think more in um, trying to um, that the synergistic muscles will help, um, but actually directing that tension as much as you possibly can to the muscle you're working. Exactly. Yeah. So when we, when we utilize machines or when we utilize isolatory movements, uh, the reason why we're doing it is to take out as much involvement of synergists as we possibly yeah. can to direct force to the prime movers which we are trying to hypertrophy or enlarge. Yeah. Now, this is another reason why as bodybuilders, you, we should invest a lot of money and time in remedial therapy because when you do create more force to a particular fiber rather than a complete group of fibers you are going to create more dominance which can create an imbalance in the joint structure so in order to alleviate 
the negative effect that that imbalance may cause to our connective tissue or to our joints themselves, we need to release the tension. We need to release a sense of a hyper tonicity to that tension. Let it know that it's okay to relax. You don't have to worry about stressing now. Let the other fibers get a chance to work. That's why when we, as bodybuilders, when we try and go and do, say for example, you've seen this, right? We go into a gym and see, see someone trying to do a leg curl. And the back moves, uh, the bum moves before the knee even able to flex to its full degree. That's because there's tonicity, hypertonicity probably in the lumbar, spine, lumbar section of the spine or the anterior part of the hip, the quads, or the rectus femoris is part of the quad group. So the question is, when do we know what, to, what exercise to do for compound movements or for hypertrophic movements? Sorry, for strength-based movements or hypertrophic programming? Strength-based movements are when you're trying to engage maximal neural drive in a very balanced body. Hypertrophy movements are when you're trying to reestablish one factor, when you're trying to reestablish balance or structural balance to the body by taking out accessory um, muscles that are overly worked or overly toned to incorporate more drive to muscle that's in inhibited. Or for the purpose of a bodybuilder, to enlarge in a particular fiber that is either imbalanced to other fibers or for the purpose of getting bigger and more jacked, as I say. Yeah, yeah that's actually, uh, uh, the way you explain it now, uh, it's a very good way of explaining and understanding. It's a very simple way of, of understanding the difference between strength training and, and hypertrophy training. We can get complicated and we can start talking about different force angles. We can start talking about momentum and inertia factors. We can start talking about torque and all these fancy physics components and exercise. But to be honest, all that's going to do is create more confusion where there is already enough confusion. Yeah. Think of it in a very simple term. If you're trying to contract the muscle and you're not feeling it, you're not feeling the contraction. You don't feel that muscle under strain, but you feel, let's take a very simple, uh, simple exercise. Going into a gym, you see someone trying to do bicep curls and their neck looks like it's about to explode but the biceps don't even have their vein popping out what's working are the biceps working or the traps working yeah traps, traps being these muscles here guys from you guys are unaware with anatomy so what is that guy is he actually performing the exercise in line with the muscle he's trying to grow no he's not not right so we can start complicating this and talk about you know what does the bicep do it helps to supinate helps to flex the elbow as well as the humor uh, as well as the shoulder glenhumeral joint going to all these complex you know as simple as if you can't feel a muscle contract you're trying to grow it's not going to grow because you're over utilizing another muscle in place of a muscle you're trying to grow so what do you do reduce the load why not because you're weak, too weak that you can't lift it. Yeah, you can, I'm sure you can lift it, lift it with compensatory patterns, but your mind has been overwhelmed by utilizing another muscle and doesn't know how to connect with the muscle that you're trying to make grow or trying to contract. So what do you do? You slow things down enough so your mind can catch up with the body so you can actually contract the muscle perfectly and make it grow. So I, at the, uh, my arms at the moment measure 51 centimeters around, 51 and a half centimeters around circumference. The actual readings, not those fake readings that they say they're 23 inch arms and you actually meet the guys in person and they're not 23 inches. Yeah. So I've got relatively big size arms. You know what I do for my curls? I used to do um, best, best ever, not best ever, sorry, so most compensated ever barbell curl yeah. I used to do was 90 kilo barbell curls for six mm -hmm. reps when I was younger. And it wasn't yeah. the biceps. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. You know what I do now? 40 kilos at max. Yeah. The dumbbells I use, I never go over 14 kilo dumbbells anymore. Because that, that is enough weight to allow me to connect and contract my bicep. Not my shoulder, not my neck, not my pectorals. Yeah. Although they do help, but they help to the right amount of stimulation. They don't over yeah. compensate in the movement yeah. itself. Yeah. Okay, so this is very, very important to understand. When we get a program for strength, 
or we're in a program for hypertrophy, what is the intention? A strength training program is to increase maximum global neural drive to shift the load from point A to point B with the best form possible to not cause strain to the connective tissue or to the joints. It's not for the maximal degree of an isolated sensation to a particular muscle in question. All right? Hypertrophy training, or if you want to call it structural balance training, because it is structural balance, hypertrophy is structural balance training, in my opinion, is to reestablish aesthetics for, for the purpose of bodybuilding, or balance of per perception to where that joint is in space and time. And how do we do that? We increase the sensation to muscle around that joint in space and time. So we go back, we say, okay, first we increase this, we increase this, we increase this. Then we know where this is, we know where this is, we know where this is, so we know where this is when we're trying to contract and move a joint. When we move away or through an exercise. Yeah. So that's a fundamental difference. Um, very, very easy way to go about it. Hypertrophy, try to feel the muscle. Strength, try to feel the structure, the entire structure in question. Know where everything is throughout the movement to, in order to engage the right amount of contraction for the entire body, not to overstrain or to overcompensate causing you knee pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, back pain, whatever it might be. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, basically um, what I'm de deriving from everything that you're saying as well is that even though exercise selection is important, um, if, if you're not executing it properly, you can have the best designed program in the world. If you don't ex execute the exercises, as you should or, or as close to perfectly as you can then you're going to still have an ineffective workout most definitely i think that's yeah. 90, 99 percent of the, the fitness community's problem is that it's gun ho it's about lifting as much weight for as much ego as possible and there's a lot of people out there that are far stronger than me and nearly as big as me but and I have a lot of respect for people that lift weight well and lift a lot more. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the strongest bodybuilder out there by far. Um, but one thing I do pride myself on is having learned good technique and good form. And I always will appreciate a lifter that can lift 100 kilos with precision more so than a guy that puts 200 kilos in the bar and looks like he's, jumping on, he's going on a jumping castle doing squats. Bouncing out, bouncing mm -hmm. out, bouncing, dropping down so fast, it, it's as if NASA sponsored him to create enough projection to put a rocket into space. Okay? Yeah. That, ha that serves no purpose apart from ego. Yeah. Well, one thing I always. You have media to blame for that. You have, like, you know, there's a lot of bodybuilders in the past that, for the purpose of sensation in their exercise videos, lifted far more weight than they normally would do with far more momentum to yeah. engage a dramatic, wow, look at which way he's lifting. You know, no illusion, this guy's in pain like that on a consistent basis. And the ones yeah. that did, you know, are walking around in crutches nowadays or in wheelchairs. Um, so, you know, these, these things need to be taken into consideration. Yeah, uh, uh, like Ronnie Coleman. I mean, everyone knows Ronnie Coleman and his, his feats of strength. And as much as he is someone to look up to, I also think he's, 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 the, he's the main cause of a very big problem because people will look at Ronnie Coleman and they'll lift or lift heavy. And then when you ask them, why are you, why are you lifting so heavy? They'll say it's because, well, Ronnie Coleman did that. And then my best response to them is always, are you Ronnie Coleman? Like, are you Ronnie Coleman? Yeah, but Ronnie did it this way. And then I think, yeah, like you said, you know, Ronnie didn't always train this heavy either. And people, people doesn't, they don't understand that. They don't even know that. But then they look at his videos, which, I mean, his videos are awesome. I love his stuff. But it's, he, he never lifts like that 24-7. And But, like, he, he's a big, he's a big cause to this whole problem of ego lifting. 
he served purpose of sensation to sell a product and that's his product yeah. himself all right he's a is a world-class olympic champion but i'm sorry olympia not olympic olympia champion um and behind that comes a following because remember bodybuilding when it started off back in gosh mainstream bodybuilding starting off in the 50s mainstream yeah it was there was around um but it wasn't really mainstream until about the 50s the movie stars started doing it uh, and they became a bit more uh, lucrative and as it became more lucrative it became more extreme and then bodybuilders are associated as superhuman in the public side right freaks of nature yeah and to live up to that appeal one needs to live feats of and create feats of feats of wonder mm. and this is why you had guys I have a lot of respect for Ronnie Coleman. I think he's a fantastic spokes was a fantastic spokesperson for a particular period in bodybuilding bodybuilding's history, which required a little bit more of a energetic injection into the public's eye. Yeah, and he provided energy, right? And he changed how people uh, were more engaged to the sport. But also with that came, you know, for every positive there is a negative. Um, and the negative was that it wasn't much emphasis on, on form or technique. It was pure, just gross strength, yeah. which is, if you know, if you have genetics like Ron Coleman, uh, or Kevin Levrone, um, which also, he also lifted a ton of weight. Yes. Going from being, you know, a musician and also being a gross bodybuilder in the period of a few months. Yeah. Nobody had a transformation like Kevin Levrone. Um, you know, you're going to sit, if you're going to try and lift like these guys and you don't have the genetic fortitude to have been blessed with this ten, tendon strength or the joint bone density or the, the recovery capacity of their muscle tissue, regardless of the amount of supplements you use, whether you are assisted or not assisted, you're going to set yourself up with a lot of problems in the future, if not in the, in the current moment when you tear something. Yeah. Uh, bodybuilding is just that. It's not tearing building. It's not destructive building. It's bodybuilding. Yeah. How do you build a strong body? You build it with the correct intention. And the correct intention is not going to, for the purpose of lifting double your body weight. Unless you're a power lifter or whatever it is. Like, this is another thing that gets me is people equate their strength to how much they can lift in accordance to their body weight, but they don't take any account into any other internal factors, lever length, muscle fiber type, tentacle properties and factors. If you had an injury, you had a scar, if you've had serious um, body mutations or body um, mutilations occurring and i'm not talking about self mutilations so please don't don't get me involved in any of the crazy crazy cults out there but when you've been in an accident and you know half your calf had a needle spike go through it do you think that's not going to affect your tensile property of how much weight you're going to lift so as you say now i'm going to lift double my body weight because that's what the industry says is a good way to go but not take into account the history or the genetic capacity uh, it's just crazy i I've, I've made you know people say i don't have the genes to look good i've made people that seemingly don't have good genes look great and you know why it's because i don't make them lift in accordance to the deemed value of where they should be lifting toward uh, i get them to lift toward their genetic capacity and guess what they look amazing because everybody can look good everyone can look great not everyone can perform like an athlete though. This is something that people don't even understand. Yeah. Not everyone will have the mental acuity to be able to handle metabolites from training as well as others. So these, these things all need to be considered. Yeah. Okay, well then, I also want to know, um, how do you know when to focus more on on the shortened range of the muscle or the lengthened range or the mid range in a work in a particular workout or maybe in a week like how would you how would you know okay so today i'm going to focus more on the short shortest range 
and a little bit in the lengthened and a little bit in the mid, or today's going to be more lengthened. Um, how would you go about that? The state of one's neurology, the state of one's um, or compensation. So when our bodies are in a state of stress, or, or let's not say our bodies, let's take it back a step. Our, a muscle is in a state of stress. Let's take a common muscle, quadriceps. All right, overly used for most people. Because most people look down at computers, roll their spines forward into a state of flexion, which causes the pelvis to go into a state of anterior rotation, causing the quadriceps to be more active. Now, think about what is a shortened range of contraction for the quadriceps? Yeah, it's in that same seated position. Hips yeah. are flexed. And with, the, are, with the leg extended, yeah. And knees extended, right? Now, can most people actually get into the full range of extension in that position? No, probably not. They get up to about two inches off for full extension of the knee. Why? Because yeah. firstly, they lift way too much weight on a leg extension machine. <laughs> the guy's doing full racks and going like this. Yeah, the, the butt comes up the whole time uh, and they, they, they barely any the knee. Body, body, the body pendulum swing rather than the knee extension. Yeah, I, I see that all the time, man. So, why do, we, why do we want to increase contraction in the shortened range? What is the purpose? Uh, let's, not take it, let's not take it from a, an aesthetic point of view. Let's take it from a, a kinesiology point of view. Okay. Why would we want to create contraction in a shortened range of motion? So, from my knowledge, I would say it will be to increase... Um, uh, almost to, I don't know if, I, if I'm going to put this the right way, but increase neural drive, but also increase contractile capacity of your quad. True. But if the neural drive to that muscle is already excessive, and it's causing the muscle to be excessively toned, how are we going to, how's that muscle going to have increased contractile capacity? If it's already okay. toned, the, 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 the truth is the muscle doesn't have full contractile capacity because it has excessive, I'm going to call it intermediate contractile um, positioning or current status. Okay, so when a muscle is hypertonic, it can't really fully contract and it can't really fully lengthen. It's in a state of um, useless limbo. Okay, but the reason why it's in useless limbo is because generally when a prime mover or a large mass of muscle becomes hypertonic is because it's trying to stabilize a joint or, a bone or, or uh, some type of skeletal tissue, whether it be a femur, whether it be humerus or whatever it might be. The purpose of training in a shortened range of contraction is to create a release. So when you contract a muscle, and I'm not talking about swinging the muscle into contraction, I'm talking about actively contracting the muscle to its most to highest potential end range of motion. You are going to maximally cause a neural drive to that tissue to allow that muscle to actually relax. But when you release the tension from its maximum point of contraction, during the eccentric phase, if you just drop down, it's going to go back again and create a negative synaptic response, creating negative hypertonicity where you don't want. So when we train it in range motion, it's very beneficial for those who have tension in the knees, tight knees, like they can't get into the squat because the knees hurt. It's very good to utilize end range contraction with the right load, with the right intention, and the right tempo control to release the tissue from a state of hypertonicity. Because contraction, active contraction, causes active relaxation of the tissue. Okay. okay? And don't th but don't be confused. When we use the word relaxation, the muscle's never truly relaxed. Mm -hmm. Regardless if you're lifting a weight or not, the muscle's always in a state of tension. Otherwise, your bones would be in a bag of soup. Yeah. All right? So muscle's always contracting in some way or some form. Just either uh, it depends on the frequency to which it's contracting. Right now, my muscles are all contracting for me to be able to engage my posture, to look at you in the, in the computer screen and have this conversation. 
So short and range motion is effective when we are in a state of hypertonicity, but it's only effective if applied appropriately. Okay. Length and range. Now, do we create more muscle growth in the shorter range of contraction or in the length of range of contraction? From my experience, um, not that I've studied this or I know the correct answer, but from my experience, I found, especially if I spend more time training in the lengthened range, and I, I found this with, with my quad training because I spent so much emphasis and so much time trying to build up my quads uh, because I have the slight obsession of having the biggest quads on the planet. But I found that the more time I actually spend in the lengthened range, the best growth I've seen in my legs. Although I do spend time in the shorter, shortened range because it feels very good and I get a very good response. But then if I move on to the more lengthened range and I spend a lot more time there, then actually I've seen some very good growth in my legs, especially. So let's think about this. When we train, so now we have a th muscle tissue, right? So let's, bring, let's take the, the rectus femoris as part of the quadricep group. And let's say this is the hip, and then this is to the patella tendon. When we control it in leg extensions, short lunge, right? Hips there, that's where the rectus femoris is now. That's the length of it. Yeah. And then basically the knee is going like this, right? Well, how much muscle mass has been lengthened over here? Uh, not that much. How much. Muscle mass has been broken down. And how do we grow muscle? We break it down. We create a cata controlled catabolic environment for the most optimal anabolic adaptation. So when we train in a short range, we're only training a small percentile, or not a maximal percentile, of the tissue's potential for growth. But right. training in a short range may be a benefit if you cannot get full eccentric range of that tissue because it's in a state of, because it's in a state of? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch that first part. When we train the muscle, Mm -hmm. In a shorter range of contraction, it's beneficial when the muscle can't get into a lengthened state of contraction because it's in a state of uh, hypertension. Hyperten hypertonicity. Yes. Hypertension. Exactly. So, short range contraction is beneficial to allow tissue that is excessively toned to have the potential of active contraction for maximal active relaxation active relaxation, it's yeah. very important word active, so that we can increase that range of contraction or break down potential of a controlled catabolism to the muscle tissue through its entirety. Training in a lengthened state is far more uh, efficient for the purpose of hypertrophy, hypertrophy, key term, purpose of hypertrophy, mm -hmm. right? not necessarily the purpose of maximal strength, okay? It doesn't always equate to the same thing because remember maximal strength you don't necessarily have to lengthen that entire muscle to its yeah. greatest degree because you're not just training that muscle you're training the entire system so yeah. the muscle when it lengthens to a certain point another muscle needs to have an interaction to create more structural uh, integrity for the whole body but when we train a muscle for the purpose of hypertrophy maximal growth to a particular fiber through a lengthened state, we're going to get better response. Okay, but we can only do that if we have like access to that lengthened state. Act access to lengthened state. And a clear example is a squat. How often have you read or have you seen in YouTube videos that people advocate full range of motion? Oh, all of them. Almost all of them. What use is going through a full range of motion if you do not have that full range of motion ability, uh, sorry, um, access to the total muscle mass in question, i.e. the glutes. How often do people have a hypertoned glutes, particularly the, the point of the glute max where its insertion is into the femur, that part of the glute max becomes excessively toned 
due to how our postures are when we sit down. It pulls the femur back, okay? Mm. The top part of the mass becomes lengthened, but right now when I'm sitting down here, if you push your fingers right onto where the femur is, where the glutes attach, you'll feel tension. So that muscle becomes shortened, all right? So if you can't lengthen that muscle because it's been in a state of shortened tone, in the most part of your day, working in an office or working down a computer, whatever it is, or just standing up straight and not squatting down often enough, and you're gonna try and go into a full range of motion of that squat, what's gonna happen? You're gonna create compensation because the muscle can't stretch. It doesn't want to, it's been holding on for gear life for God knows how long. It doesn't feel safe stretching, so it's gonna redirect the force elsewhere, primarily from the hip into the knee. So, full range motion is only as good as the muscle's active control. If you have full active control or full active range of that muscle, yes, full range of motion is the most beneficial to muscle growth. 110% agree with that. But that's not take, when we, in the industry, when people talk about full range of motion, they never ever mention the individual. Yeah. Uh, and where that individual is. And even an athlete will have a day where they're excessively toned. Even the best athletes in the world, which I would never be able to compare my physical capacity to theirs, not from a country mile. I'm more he heavily hypertonic than they could ever, or ever probably be. But even those guys will have limited range of motion in certain days of question. And if you do not take into account the range of control that they have to their tissue, prior to training and you make them do those full ranges of motion they're going to strain the tissue and when you strain the tissue you cause pain to other tissue okay what's the biggest difference between strain and pain a strain is strain is the actual almost the tearing of the muscle fibers strain is the action is generally sorry not the action strain is the reaction to the cause of over use of a muscle tissue okay okay pain is the action or the reaction to excessive amount of contraction occurring to a muscle tissue okay when a muscle tissue becomes hyper tonic excessive contraction pain when you're trapped when you get a headache and traps are turn all the hypertonic pain you get a painful headache strain when you try to um when you try to touch your toes and as you're going down to touch your toes you feel a sharp pull either in the back of your knees or into your back strain because you're over stretching a muscle that doesn't want to be over stretched but they fall hand in hand with one another you can go from a state of strain into a state of pain because when you overly strain the muscle tissue, it will inevitably tighten itself up because it doesn't want to have itself injured again or perception of injury, and it becomes painful. Painful. Yeah, okay. That's awesome. Yeah, that's very, that's very fascinating. Okay, so I've got another question. Um, in the previous um, Zoom call, and we, also, we were also talking about exercise selection and everything. Uh, you mentioned that certain metabolites starts building up from training and then that actually slows down the response from the brain to that specific muscle you're working. Now what I want to know is, 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 say this is happening while you're training and you're realizing, okay, so I can feel this metabolites are building up. I can feel that, I, that I'm not as sharp as I was in the beginning of the workout. How would that then influence or affect your workout at that moment? And how would you then go to another exercise? Uh, what would your next exercise then be like? Say, say if, say if you were doing squats or deadlifts, um, what would your next exercise then be? So, like any investment, an exercise is an investment for the purpose of what return? Sorry, say again. Exercise. Is an investment for the purpose of what return? What return do you get from exercise? Uh, growth, um, muscle, 
muscle. Yeah, muscle. Increased muscle mass. Like any investment, there's a point to pull out and to put in. So there's a point of a negative return. When you are training a muscle, we're not talking about a movement now. So we're talking about squats and you can't do a squat anymore. It might not necessarily be because the muscle that you're trying to access in conjunction to multiple other muscles is tired. Say, for example, when you're doing a squat, you want to access some cooperation of the rectus femoris to grow bigger or the glutes or the hamstrings, whatever it might be that you're trying to depend on your stance, depending on depth, everything else. It might not be that muscle that gets exhausted. It might be the spinal extensors. Let's just say from the pelvis to the spine, they become tired. Okay. Or it might be the rhomboids and doing a front squat, they become tired. Right? Or in my go. case, in my case, my glutes. Right. So your glutes, because your glutes are probably a hypertonic in yeah. certain parts of them. So that's when they become fatigued because that they become into a state of excessive strain because they're not used to stretching. Okay. So then they get tired. All right. So if you go from a muscle that's tired, and if you train the tired muscle through a more shortened range, right? So you go from, say, for example, a squat to a barbell hip extension. And the barbell hip extension is a far shorter range of extension to the gluteal group than a squat. A squat's far deeper range of stretch to the gluteal group as a whole than a barbell hip extension. Yeah. People say, no, but it's more isolated to the glutes. Of course, it must be, no, it's isolated to a certain component within the glutes, not its entirety. It really isn't, all right? You're not going to get nowhere near as much glute, glute medial or glute min recruitment in a barbell hip extension than you are in a squat because there's nowhere near as much internal rotation occurring in the corner during the flexion of that hip, nowhere near. And the purpose of the glutes during, hip, during, the eccentric, the squat, during the eccentric phase of a squat is for stability for the main part and then through the concentric, a phase of a squat or the extension of the hip is for drive. Mm -hmm. So when a muscle fatigue, like say you're taking the glutes in a squat, and all of a sudden you want to put a barbell hip extension in there, you've got to ask yourself the question, am I going to get a return on this exercise or is that tissue so exhausted that I'm going to get a negative return? Remember one thing that I've had to learn the hard way. It's not about the quantity that you put into exercise or effort. And this doesn't just go to exercise, it goes to life, work, commitment, everything. It's not about the quantity you put in, it's about the quality and the return of your efforts. You can work 12 hours, 16 hour days and get nothing for it. I know I've done it. You can work four hour days and get threefold the return which is what you would rather be doing. So it's about how much you get out of doing something rather than just doing something. So when you go to the gym and you want to train a muscle, where you say, okay, it's tired now, but I want to keep on training. I just have a question. Am I going to get a return from continuing my training session? No. Use your intuition, use your mind. You can't, remember what I said to you before, if you cannot feel a muscle contracting, it's not going to grow. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you can increase more heat shock proteins by more metabolic um, turnover of energy production. Sure. But you can also do that going on a watt bike, doing high intensity interval training. Is that going to grow the muscle? as much as eccentrically loading that tissue to its maximal degree of proprioception and control of contraction? No. Or are you gonna sacrifice metabolic waste increase for the purpose of hormonal release as well? Because things like IGF, a growth hormone, IGF-1, all these other, um, like mentioned before, you're talking about a targeted rapamycin, Million mTOR and all these great mm -hmm. things. They're all, they're all lovely, lovely and very complex biological processes of muscle building or anabolism. However, we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we want muscle to be built in areas we're not focused on? 
Yeah. It's all good and well, increasing metabolic activity, but where are we trying to grow that tissue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, you'll grow more tissue because there are going to be more hormonal substrates. There's only necessarily to the benefit of your stru entire structure as a whole. Mm -hmm. Okay? Just remember, compensation is so easily formed when you overtrain. And the return of your investment can be a negative one. You will still get a return, but it can be a negative return. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so let's say, let's say it's not due to fatigue of that muscle you're actually training. So when you're training the quads in a squat and it's actually um, the glutes that start to fatigue or the spinal erectors or in the front squat, like you said, the rhomboid starts fatiguing, um, but you you know you, you have at least three or four more sets left in your quads. Um, to which exercise would you then move on to? Um, would it be a more supported movement? Most definitely, because you'll take out the, the, the accompanying muscles or the synergists uh, and you put more effort onto the muscle in question. So when you have the more supportive structure, the synergists can relax, the stabilizers of tissue can relax because they have a support structure to brace against rather than bracing again within itself. So your tensegrital properties or sorry, your sensegral priority reduces when you have something to press against. You know, mm -hmm. anything to press against, you have to create internal contraction and compression and tension forces. When you have something to press against, you can compress against something that already has compressive forces, creating tension against. Make sense? Yeah. But now, when we're trying to create that, so how do we know that the muscle has more in it? How do we know the muscle actually has more? Potential in it. In fact, you said now you know that you have your quads and have three or four more sets. How do you know? How would you that's, know? A, that's actually a very good question. Um, well, you go to the exercise that's more isolated and you try and contract the muscle. If you can feel it contracting, you have more to go. If you feel everything else straining just to get that lever up in the leg extension, guess what? You're overdoing it. Yeah. So basically, basically uh, incorporating what people will call a, a feel set. 100%. People don't like, people don't take the time to acknowledge what their bodies are telling them. Like the best gauge of what you're capable of doing is not a training program. Uh, it's not necessarily HRV, which I use, which is fantastic, or fasting glucose, which is also a great tool. It's actually your own intuition. Uh, unfortunately, most of us become so deconditioned to not listen to what our bodies are telling us that we don't even know what to do. Yeah. The reason why we utilize tools like glucose, and heart rate variability, blood uh, chemistry analysis, because we've lost the a sensation, sorry, we've lost the ability to have a sense mm. of what our bodies are telling us. Our five senses become dwindled. How many people have an impaired sense of smell, impaired hearing, bad eyesight, um, poor sense of touch, like the awesome to touch rough or smooth surfaces, they can't really describe it to you. Poor mm -hmm. sense of taste. How many people have become so deconditioned to the sense of taste for the volume of sugar, preservatives, um, additives that have been in their food source? Your five senses, the five senses that we have are completely uh, disorganized and disassociated that we don't even know what's going on. So with training, with the right amount of tension, the load, i.e. load, and the right control to it, you increase the body's opportunity to once again engage in its most basic sense, the sense of touch. Okay, it's one of the most basic, it's the most, one of the most global senses we have. You can touch your tongue, Touch your nose, you can touch your ears, you can even touch your eyes if you really wanted to. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Touch your hands, everything. You can't see with your hands, you can't hear with your hands, you can't smell with your hands, you can't taste with your hands. Mm -hmm. The sense of touch is probably the most global sense that we have available to us. And it's probably the more easier of senses to re engage if the Intention is done in the correct circumstances. Overwhelm the intention, 
your sense of touch is going to go, just like your sense of taste. Why does our sense of taste become dwindled? Why do we lose our sen the sensation and sense of taste when we have food? No, I mean, when, you, when you're a kid, you remember when you were a kid and you taste uh, like you had, say for example, you had a hamburger, right? Do you remember how that hamburger tasted? It tastes a lot better than it does now. Yeah. Right? Why? Because we bombard our sense of taste with too much sensation, too much traumatic sensation. Sugar is such a powerful mm -hmm. um, food source, particularly a refined sugar, if you want to call it a food source, and rather than a drug source, which I think is more of a drug source than a food source, yeah. um, that we have such a huge rush of sensation to our brain when sugar touches our tongues. Uh, and immediately you feel like, right? You do that often enough, you don't feel anymore. You feel, yeah. Okay. That's, that, that's why cheat meals after comp prep always taste so much better than when you're in the off season. Because you've increased your sensation of mm -hmm. taste. So, how do we increase our sensation of touch? Not by lifting too much weight, not by lifting for too long a period of time not by lifting past the point at which we can actually feel a muscle contracting, but by lifting to the point where we can feel contraction, lifting a weight that we can control with the correct amount of tempo, and lifting, once again, with regard to tempo, at the right tempo, with, at the right speeds, with the right amount of intention to what we're trying to contract in the first place. Yeah. Then we increase a sense, the sensation of a sense. And that is how we grow muscle. Now the brain is the most important part of, the, of our biology to integrate into balance and control, okay? Because the brain controls everything. But the brain requires all five senses to be maximally engaged. So in order to engage all five senses, we have to train appropriately so we have a sensation of touch come through. We need to ensure that we don't have too much stress because the stress has a reaction to the olfactory system, which will affect our hearing, and affect our sensation of, of smell. We need to limit ourselves to pollution, sense of smell. We need to limit ourselves to, to noise pollution, sense of hearing. We need to limit ourselves to artificial UV light exposure, sense of sight. Limit ourselves to um, expose ourselves to more natural blue light, sense of sight. Yeah. Then all those five senses come back online and our brains react in a better manner. But until you cut out all the crap in the diet, sense of taste, which has effect on the brain, cut out watching TV for four hours a night before going to bed or cut out not, uh, or limit the damage that UV exposure, artificial uh, blue light might have to your brain by utilizing blue light blockers, which I'm not doing tonight, which is bad of me. Um, yeah. Or limit the amount of pollution, everything from cigarette smoke to alcohol, to additives, to processed foods that you get from McDonald's or Burger King or whatever it is. Limit the loud noise pollution instead of playing your speakers in your car at full max, acting like big, a big boy, <laughs> but just rather putting at a, a reasonable sound volume that you can hear rather than blasting your iPhone at full max because you don't want to hear the crazy fat guy, sorry, the crazy, person next to you moan and complain about whatever they're moaning and complaining about, mm. then you'll have a better sensation of hearing. Or maybe just don't listen to your, don't put your headphones in all the time. Maybe you're going to sit outside a nice quiet park and just try to listen to nature. Yeah. Senses, sensations, it's how we inc increase potential on all factors, not just, not just muscle growth, but all factors. Um, so yeah, that's it's very, very important to mm. consider. Yeah. I'm actually very glad you brought up the five senses um, because 
unconsciously, I didn't even, like what you taught me now, I did not know, but I found myself multiple times in the gym where I actually wished that I had the noise blocking earphones. Um, so I could just block out all the noise. Uh, somehow I could just feel like it, it's something that I need. It's, uh, it's uh, my body just needed like to block out all the noise. And I would actually, in a set, uh, I, I can still remember I was doing leg press and I made sure I was, I was fixed in my position and I would actually push my fingers into my ears as hard as I could. And uh, I actually loved it. Uh, I loved the feeling that I got when I did that. So it, everything you said makes so much sense. Noise pollution. Uh, it's really bad, especially if you have more noise coming from the left side of your body or the right side of your body. It's going to cause a uh, reaction to the hemisphere of your brain to be more dominant, for sure. Um, it's, it's very important to notice that you note that, you know, like uh, everyone says, talks about, like we just spoke about now, from going from if you have those extra reps and, uh, you know, and you have metabolites, do you push it? Well, she would say yes, if you don't have a sense, if you don't have good sensation, you go and do it. I think it's going to do your benefit because you know, there's loads of journals documenting the benefits of heat shock proteins and growth hormone levels. Mm. It might be true, but what are the side effects to that? Not the growth hormone levels, what are the side effects to over uh, pushing past your boundaries in terms of how your neurology is going to engage with your periphery? So senses are very important. Um, and then when it comes to training, not, not nutrition, not other lifestyle factors, we need to lift correctly and we need to lift the right amount of load to increase our sense of touch, not to overwhelm it. Hmm. That's awesome. That's definitely, definitely something that I'll incorporate more every day into my training. Do yourself a favor, sense of taste. Next time you go in and you do a movement that requires quite a great deal of stretch. So like a squat requires quite a great deal of stretching um, or a pull-up requires quite a great deal of stretching. Before you do a pull-up, yeah. I just want you to take a little bit of sugar, a tiny bit of sugar, put it on your tongue, and I want you to try and do a full eccentric, eccentric rep of a pull-up. Then I want you to take a lemon, just lick, you know, lick a lemon or take a little bit of lemon, mm -hmm. and then try and do it as well. See the difference. Why? What does the lemon do? Alkalizes the body. What does sugar do? Acidifies the body. Mm -hmm. Just do that. Just do a difference of take some sugar for a set of five reps and see if you can sustain eccentric contraction as opposed to a lemon for a set of five reps. And see if you can sustain eccentric contraction. Do a little something that will experiment. And I'd like for you to do a little video and send it to me about the outcome of it. Actually do it while you're doing it. Take a video of yourself. Mm. Get a lovely girlfriend to do it for you because she's such a great aid to your bodybuilding career. You're very blessed. Not many, not many people have that. So it's going to be yeah. the person to have on your side. Mm. Get your ass into gear. Have her, she also going to compete sometime. Yeah, she wants to compete next year. Yeah. Fantastic. It's very good that you have like-minded relationship when it comes to the sport. It's tough otherwise. Have her do the recording for you. I'd really like you to do it. A little bit of sugar, do five reps. Tell us about the response. And then do a little bit of lemon, and do five reps. Can I just do it straight after? Give it a minute between the sets. Just so you, just to get a different sensation. Yeah. And then see okay. I'll definitely give that a try. You'll see what you what you put in your body, how much of an effect it has to your potential contraction. Yeah, so then essentially what you eat as a pre-workout meal is going to make all the difference. Yep, it's going to make the world of difference in your training. Why don't I have sugar before I train? Yeah. Not because it's going to dwindle my uh, catecholamine release and hormone-sensitive life pace potential for fat. Nah, I don't know. A little bit of sugar is not really going to dwindle that. It really isn't before training because the amount of training I'll do, I'll break down enough tissue to warrant enough HSL release. It really will. Mm -hmm. Why do I not believe in having sugar before training? Because of the effect it has on the brain more than your immediate biology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
sugar before training is absolutely diabolical. And sugar during training, yes, may offset catecholamine release because it's, you know, if you spike insulin slightly, it will suppress the amount of catecholamines you can release. Um, sure, uh, that might help with performance in terms of uh, duration of performance. Will it actually help with eccentric capacity? No. It won't. Will they to contract a muscle for longer, but probably in a shortened state? Yep. The body will become more acidic. Because you release blood sugar through your glycogen stores when you train and release stress hormone. And then to stop releasing stress hormone, you take in exogenous sugar. So you're just actually really condensing the amount of sugar that is available in your bloodstream. And that makes you increase from excessive state of excitation to the body. And if you're excessively excited, you're excessively toned, which means you cannot stretch the muscle properly, which means you will not break it down to its full potential, which means you'll be able to train for longer. Yes, 100% guaranteed you will. But are you going to be able to train that muscle to the point of positive return on your investment or to a negative return on your investment? I guarantee you the latter is more likely scenario. And those who do like high volume training, you know who it really benefits? People that take a lot of steroids. Why? Because androgens also help to block the cortisol receptor in the muscle tissue. Okay? If you're not assisted, um, even if you are assisted, you'll get away from it. It's all up to the detriment in the long run. And even if you are, really, regardless of what you do toward your physical ambition, um, just knowing that excessive amounts of sugar will let you train longer, but training longer doesn't necessarily equate to better results. Why mm. would you want to train longer and put yourself through pain unnecessarily? You know, this whole idea of no pain, no gain, it's a complete malarkey. It's a complete malarkey. Mm. Too much pain completely kills your gains. Completely. Yeah. Because you're not gonna, you might get, you'll get gains in parts of your body that you shouldn't have them. Yeah, but it's it's because people people are so stuck on the old notions of, of bodybuilding. <clears throat> like you said, now having excessive amounts of amounts of sugars, um, which excites your system, it's the same as having a, a pre workout with, with 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 insane amounts of caffeine in it. What does it do? What does it do? What does pre workout do? Why does it make you energized? Well, it, it, it gives you that buzz. Uh, it's all the care, they just load it with, with caffeine. It releases stress hormone. And what does stress hormone do? It releases glucose from glycogen stores into your bloodstream. So instead of taking exogenous sugar, you just release more endogenous sugar sources. Mm. That's what it's doing. So you're creating more excitation in your body that you would naturally have because you're increasing your stress hormone release or you're increasing more available energy in your body because you're drinking sugar yeah you are training harder and you're training longer but is that effort actually going to be beneficial because training hard and training smart are two different things right. i trained hard for many years really hard and you know i look back and i think myself oh, why god i should have spent that time studying more and probably saving a lot more money and rather than wasting on all those pre-workout supplements. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, they're, they're just they only serve a one purpose: fuel for ego. Yeah. Fuel for ego. And uh, like you know, it's, it's nice when you go to the gym and you're the guy that lifts the heaviest weight, and you take a video and you put it on Instagram and say, "Oh, I did this." You know, sometimes every once in a while, I still do it because I enjoy it. a little bit. A little bit of ego is not a bad thing. But when you become narcissistic in your ambition going to the gym just for the mm -hmm. purpose of lifting heavier the next guy and coming out and feeling completely annihilated every single session, thinking that you're a titan amongst men, you are actually misplacing every effort and you're not a clever guy. You're not a clever bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. um, you're really not. Yeah. You have, you, if you were a stockbroker of bodybuilding and you did that to my investment, I would fire you because that would give me no return. Well, what I want to know, it's something very interesting that you just said, uh, with a with a pre-workout that it, it re releases the stress hormone, which releases the glucose into your bloodstream. 
would that actually affect the effectiveness of your body producing or using glucose as energy then um, to produce contractions in your workout? Would that actually impair your body to use glucose then better if it's released into your bloodstream because of the stress hormone? It would it depend on the amino acids that are in the formula themselves, because a lot of these pre-workouts would have caffeine accompanied with certain amino acids that would increase the threshold uh, of mitochondrial function. Acid or L-carnitine, mainly one of the bigger ones that they use quite often. Uh, and when you increase the mitochondrial function of glucose metabolism, uh, if you initiate a stress response with acid or carnitine, you actually amplify the workout potential. But it's not the workout potential. It's your contractile potential that you have to think about. You can train, it's one thing to train hard. And like I said, again, I'm going to reiterate what I've just said. And it's a very, very important thing to remember. One thing to train hard is another thing to train smart. You can train hard for two hours and get no return. You can train smart for 20 minutes and look like a king. Mm. So it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily going to dwindle your muscle contractile um, potential, but this it would evolve dwindles your muscle lengthening contractile potential. Okay. For sure. Of course. Because you if you're in a state of excessive excitation, for a certain period of time the muscle will lengthen to its maximum degree. But it for also for a definite hundred percent guarantee it's not going to be able to sustain its lengthening cycle for as long as if you hadn't been stressed out in the first place. Mm-hmm. Stressful training is good for metabolic conditioning. Okay, this is why high intensity interval training is fantastic for fat loss. Mm-hmm. Stressful training is not good for muscle conditioning because it will, yes, you will grow more muscle for a particular period of time with your stress training 100% because of metabolic factors, but it's going to also cause excessive amounts of hypertonicity. And hypertonicity will limit your factor or potential of eccentric capacity. Mm. Less eccentric capacity, less controlled catabolism, less anabolic potential, less muscle growth for the future, and more mm. brain to connected tissue, joints, and ligamental structures. Yeah, you explained it perfectly. It's the intention. And we're not just talking about like force in, force out, and bars and all that great stuff, uh, which is which is fun. It's the intention of how you can control your body to elements of your environment. And if the potential becomes dwindled, then it's useless. We are. That's all the time we have. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I have a, a, a dinner waiting for me. Um, it was lovely chatting to you. Look forward to our next Zoom call. Yeah. We'll leave that topic as a surprise for our viewers out there. Yes, definitely. Anything else that you would like to add before we have to go? Mm, actually, no. I think uh, you've you've explained things so clearly that I'm literally just going to watch this video now and write down everything you said uh, because you've explained everything so clearly and you've you've laid everything out so in such a simple way that. You don't need a ton of degrees to understand what you said. Um, yes, I actually I loved this this little um, podcast video course that we did. Uh, yeah, I think it, this was brilliant, and I can't wait for for the upcoming ones. Well, I'm looking forward to training you next year and getting you ready for the competition season. Yeah, uh, it's going to be great. Um, I've got you and this, uh, five of the other guys. You might have a girl on board. Um, mm. If your fiance. Uh, is, no, it's just, just my girlfriend. If your girlfriend is up for competing, uh, it would be good to have her on board as one of the female athletes because we want to get uh, at least two female athletes on board with six male athletes. Mm. So, um, yeah, let's have a word with her. It would be good if you guys both do it together, especially if you're following the same glucose management, heart rate variable management, everything else. Awesome. All right, Rian, have a lovely evening. And Thanks, you too. Merry Christmas. Yes, same to you. Thanks. Enjoy the time with your friends and your family. And I will wait. Just let me know next week because next week is obviously the week before New Year's. So time may be a bit restricted, but 
let me know what works for you. I'll be available on either Tuesday or Thursday. I won't be available on the Wednesday. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Have a good one, Rian. Take care. Thanks, Justin.